Now, there is a super simple, very quick test that you can do to figure out if you have bowel disease or gut issues, okay? Which I'm gonna explain at the end. You can fast forward if you want, but I recommend that you just hear me out because I have some very important points related to your gut, whether you have celiac, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, diverticulitis, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. When we're talking about bowel disease, it usually relates to your microbes, okay? You have trillions of microbes in your gut, and there could be some alteration in the amounts or the type of microbes. You might have too little good bacteria and too much bad bacteria. And so, of course, people will say, well, you need to feed your bacteria fiber. And this is why they recommend 11 servings of grains, right? With at least three of those 11 servings being whole grains. Because, of course, we all know that fiber feeds the microbes, right? We want healthy fiber. But the confusing part about that is whole grains doesn't usually have much fiber, like 7% fiber. It's not that much. It has a lot of other things like starch, but it's not like a very high fiber food. It also has phytic acid in it, which if you don't know what that is, that blocks minerals, okay? Specifically iron, zinc, calcium, magnesium. It tightly binds minerals. So if anyone were to tell you that, well, grains are nutrient dense, just bring up this point about phytic acid. That blocks the nutrition in whole grains. But in refined grains, there is not hardly any nutrition because they're refining it. That's why they have to fortify or enrich the grains with some a couple synthetic vitamins. And then they can call it a nutrient-dense foods because you're adding a couple of synthetic vitamins. And then we have the protein in grains, which is gluten, which literally tears up the digestive tract and creates so many problems. So even though you may not have a gluten allergy, it could be a gluten sensitivity. So that's a real big factor. So honestly, I think the worst thing you could possibly eat for digestive problems is grains. Now, when we talk about fiber in general, um, people associate you have to eat enough fiber to prevent constipation because we all know for a fact that constipation is just a lack of fiber. And if you just take more fiber, then you can actually go on a regular basis. Now, there's a lot of different types of fiber out there. You have fiber from the grain, you have fiber from salad, right? That's a good amount of fiber. Plus the salad has no gluten. There's very little amounts of phytic acid, except maybe in certain things like spinach that has oxalates and phytic acid. It also has a lot of nutrients, potassium, magnesium, folic acid, vitamin C. So of course, salad would be a much better fiber than grains. And then you have all these new functional fibers they're talking about in all the keto treats like the soluble corn fiber and the tapioca fiber and the inulin and the chicory root, okay? With so many people having digestive bloating and gas from these products, it's just off the chart. So what is happening in the colon that's creating all this bloating and gas? Well, you're getting this fermentation, okay? These microbes are attempting to break down some of these fibers and they're releasing a lot of methane gas and other gases and all sorts of things that are creating um, distension and pain in your colon. Now, relating to microbes, there's three types of general categories of microbes. You have microbes that are harmful okay, to you. Those are called pathogens. You also have microbes that help you, okay, like friendly bacteria. Those are called mutualists. They have a mutual relationship with you. They give you certain benefits and then you give them certain benefits. You give them a place to live, right? So there's this nice exchange. Then you have microbes that are kind of neutral. They're called commensal. They live in your body. They don't harm you. They don't help you. They don't bother you. So here's what you need to know about that. A good amount of the microbes that you have in your gut actually can change, morph into the bad guys. So in other words, you can have a microbe that is neutral, that can turn pathogenic. Because if you think about it, where do these bad microbes come from, right? Do they just kind of appear from nowhere? No, they're actually coming from a condition from being neutral to now being pathogenic or harmful. And that definitely applies to like E. coli and H. pylori and C. diff. 
and even candida. When the environment of your gut changes, these microbes shift their state of beingness, their condition, and they can start creating trouble for you. So when the environment changes, like there's stress in your gut, um, one stress would be antibiotics, right? Now you say, well, I don't take antibiotics. Did you realize that wheat, that grain that you took, was sprayed with glyphosate, which is an herbicide and classified as an antibiotic? In fact, the company that created this product also got a patent with a different application. So glyphosate is an antibiotic. It kills microbes in the soil and it kills microbes in your gut. So we can add another one to this list with the phytic acid, the gluten, and now that's considered an antibiotic, which is really bizarre to me that they are recommending the majority of your calories should be grains. The actual thing that would create so many problems for your gut. I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing. And of course, there's other things that throw off the environment. You have drugs, you have uh, junk food, alcohol, artificial sweeteners. That's another one that can disrupt your gut. I think, and I predict down the road, we will see these functional fibers, like the corn fibers and this tapioca fibers, being something that alters the environment for the microbes to turn them from good to bad. And so when we're dealing with these gut issues, we do need to recognize and understand that these microbes are very, very important. They're the most successful in survival. They've adapted to the harshest conditions. They can live at the bottom of the ocean. They can live in the clouds. They can live in lava. I mean, it's just incredible how they have adapted. They're the most numerous. They're the most diversified. And we depend on them. And without them, we would not even be alive. They're a big part of our immune system. They help make vitamins. They help us with digestion. And they give us secondary kind of compounds that are beneficial to our health. Now, let's get to the important way to determine if you have gut issues, okay? Here we go. Step one, eliminate all fiber from your diet for three days, okay? That's step one see how you feel. Step two, add the fiber back into the diet for three days. Now compare how you felt when you eliminated the fiber versus when you added the fiber. And then you'll really know for sure if you have gut issues. It could be inflammation. It could be some other type of dysbiosis going on with your gut. But that's a really simple way without having to go through a bunch of testing, without having to wait for some scientific study without having them to put you under and having a scope go into your intestine, simply eliminate your fiber and see if you feel better. Then you know for sure something is going in your gut and that's the diet that you that's gonna work best for you right now. If you add the fiber and you feel better, chances are you don't have a gut issue and you just now fed the microbes and now they're happy because they have some food. Of course, the fiber I'm recommending is from vegetable fiber like salads. But here's the question. If you eliminate fiber, isn't that the only food for microbes? Aren't your microbes going to die off because they have no more food? Well, like I said before, microbes can adapt to almost any condition. They can eat almost any food. Did you realize that microbes can even live on metal, plastics, and even your waste? So even in a condition called SIBO, you have these friendly bacteria in your small intestine. And what are they eating? Well, they are eating the fiber, but they're also eating other nutrients. They're eating other things. They're eating protein. So if your body does not do well on fiber, then don't consume fiber. And I know in my books and things, I recommend seven to 10 cups of salad per day, but some people can't do that. Personally, when I do that, I feel better, but I know a lot of people that don't feel good when they consume that much fiber, even if it's salad not even talking about grains. In fact, I was puzzled back then when, my, when I consume more meat, okay, and not any more grains. Of course, at that time, I wasn't consuming any salad. My bowels actually did very good. And I was very confused at that at the time. But over the years, I've healed my gut and I can tolerate more vegetable fiber. And the main reason I personally consume vegetables is not necessarily just for the fiber. It's for the nutrients. It's for the potassium, magnesium, vitamin C, folate, things like that. 
just as one last side note related to this topic, when you consume fermented food like sauerkraut or kimchi, um, that is way better than fiber. So let's say, for example, you get off fiber for a period of time and you want to introduce fiber back into the diet. I would recommend introducing fermented fiber as in sauerkraut, kimchi, things like that. Now, since we're on the topic of microbes, okay, I, another really good video for you to watch would be the one on how microbes are affected when you fast. Check it out. I put it up right here.